Think of it long term. Does this asset or investment make sense? And if it does, add on more position into it. Is there a place what you are doing in your investments? Does it make sense to achieve your financial goals? And if it does, add on to it. Hi, I'm Aaron from OCBC, Head of Wealth Advisory. So basically part of Wealth Advisory, I do cover a very wide range from market insights all the way down to financial literacy. Actually, today we are here to talk a little bit more about this OCBC Financial Wellness Index, right? Which has been a long-running index, right? It's five years running. That's right. right? And apparently, I heard from the team that you are very important in in this particular one. Right? It's, this all particular, the <laughs> it's all the teamwork. It's all the teamwork. This particular iteration. PR, PR, don't so PR, okay? Right? I know it's always a teamwork, right? Oh, you, uh, teamwork makes the dream work, right? I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. Right, but in this particular iteration, apparently, you are very important in this thing, right? They were asking you all the questions about a financial persona and blah, blah, blah. Maybe you share with us what is your contribution <laughs> to all this right. FWI for all this right. year. All right. So, yeah. so, so basically, you know, this is actually being, being run by the, the market research team as well. Uh, as well as, and it's, it's a combination of looking at where are the attributes of what constitutes the principles of investing and the success of achieving the financial wellness. So this is actually being run by the market research and and pretty much, you know, we will look at all the various attributes, uh, the positive attributes of one should have uh, in order to make it more successful in, in able to attain the financial wellness. So we have about 16 of these characteristics, this, this, this traits, and out of which, uh, of the 16, well, we have two that's less positive uh, in, in these aspects. And the, other, the others will be things like the emotions that run when you, when you do a certain investing. Uh, so, so for example, you know, I was like, wow, this, this investment looks fantastic. You know, I would like to actually invest in this. And then after investing, it's like, hmm, is this actually the right thing for me? You know, um, actually, I'm not really sure about this. Seems to be a bit too high risk. Can I stomach that at risk appetite? So regretting the investing decisions uh, and having the emotions that run through that, you know, uh, maybe one is not prepared to be able to take the volatility, whether that's suitable. And that is the last positive of the attributes. So we'll run through the various iterations of what are the constructive and what are the detraction. And that kind of create the, the personas. Okay, okay, interesting. So what is your persona then? I mean, for all of you that don't, you know, have not heard you know, the first episode that we did with OCBC FWI, you can check it out, right? You know, because I am a different persona from you, right? So I just want to hear like, what is your persona? You know, so everybody gets some context. And if you have not done it, please go and do it, right? <laughs> so check out your financial persona. So my persona is the planner. Um, typical, uh, typical, typical, right? right? I mean, I'm in this job, right? Are, right? I'm in this <laughs> job. Um, I, I should be, but, but I will probably reflect upon my life and I say that I'm not the planner all the time. It's only in the later stage of my life uh, um, that I'm at, I am the planner. So I probably start off with being the enthusiast. What changed? How, how did it go from there? And I think it's quite typical that, you know, when I first enter into the workforce, you know, uh, get married. And it, once you get married, uh, that's it, right? <laughs> then, then, all the bills start coming in and go like, whoa, hang on, you know? So when you get married, you'll prepare for a wedding. And then after that, you should, uh, probably plan for starting a family, having kids. Then you realize that once you have kids, you realize, whoa, actually I was staying my parents. A bit overcrowding lah, because it was actually the same room that we were living in. So that Wait, is like you our had house. kids? While staying with your parents, exactly. Imagine oh that, right? God. So my, yeah, don't my need to room, imagine. A lot of people are like that, you know. And it's, it's very, it's very hard. It's very hard. Yeah, yeah. But please share, please share. So my bedroom is my living room and my bedroom as well, plus the kids. <laughs> so just imagine, right? So you're like, hey, actually, cannot lie. You know, we really need to save up, lah. We need to save up for for a property, for a house. You know, let's 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 make a plan. Uh, and you know, for all you know, even though the 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 heart is willing, the soul is willing, the flesh is like, oh, you know, but just cannot lah because all your bills is coming in so I become the enthusiast with, oh actually this is good this is good this is good oh, I want to plan as well but then we realize that wow actually I'm very enthusiastic about it made a lot of plans huh? but when it comes to execution it's a bit difficult mm. yeah but as time goes by as the different life stages uh, one would then realize that, hey look you know I now need to conceptualize this uh, the earlier I start actually the easier it gets and this is important. The later you start means that you have to play catch up, pay back time. 
you know, and that's where you realize, oh, okay, I just need to start small. And then on a monthly basis, I need to make plans, uh, contribute. And that's where we start watching our expenses as a family. We start to keep track. Because by keeping track, you realize, oh no, you know, we are sp- overspending this month. Next month, that's how. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, no Bobati. Right? So, so <laughs> 20 years ago, no Bobati. Hey, like, review your age. Huh? But 20, 20 years ago, no Bobati. What did, what did you cut from your expenses to plan for the property? Well, actually, quite a lot. Of, I think it's more of our going out for dinners. Family dinners are actually one of the more expensive items. Uh, of course, the ones are your clothes, your fashion wear. You know, do you really need to go for branded stuff? Uh, one or two pieces just to show off. Okay. Then after they say, hey, you know, let's cut down on some of these bigger ticket items. Even travels. Travels can actually be a very big ticket item as well. Uh, so for us, is we will be mindful of where our big ticket items are. We plan ahead, start to, you know, touch out for a few months and then save up for it. Uh, and then we keep to the budget. Yeah, so, so that's how we get by with a certain goal in mind. Uh, and then with, with that, you know, we, we will do certain adjustments uh, in terms of our expenses. Okay, do you, you want to share with everybody where do you go for honeymoon? Ah. <laughs> Just now off screen, tell me, I, I was like, oh my God, so typical. <laughs> Oh no, I, I'm not sure yeah. why we're really happy about it, but okay, I'm just going to go with it anyway, right? So, so after we got married, I got married pretty young. You know, back then when I, when I met my wife, uh, she was only like 21, 22, I was like 23. So I kind of like reserve chop after one year of, uh, of, of you know, going after her for one year. So I reserve chop, yeah, let's get years, married, yeah, let's yeah, get yeah, married. Yeah. But not now, because I need to plan, I need to have like at least a uh, one to two years to save up the money. So after that, shortly after we got married, uh, when I'm about 25, 26 years old, uh, and then say honeymoon, match expectations, we go Bangkok, okay? After we go Phuket, okay? <laughs> uh, match expectations, you know, let's keep it everything low budget, you know? Uh, then, yeah, so, sort of r- really keeping our expenses uh, tight to ensure that, you know, we really do a save savings. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's one of the, like, the easier ways to kind of just manage this thing, right? I mean, as much as it sounds a bit painful, you know, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're just going to marry once and you just want honeymoon at Phuket, come on lah, right? You know, but but I think a big part of uh, this whole starting early and getting your finances together does entail some sacrifices and you choose lah, right? Like what you say, right? It's either you pay now or you pay in the future and right? then you play catch up, right? So 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 either way, you got to do something and, and I think for a lot of our audience, they, they kind of already get a sense of this thing already. Right? Yeah. So just trying yeah. to kind of go further with that, which is where a lot of like retirement planning starts to come in, right? I mean, everybody wants to retire early, right? Like these days, the trend, right? Fire, fire, right? So financial independence, retire early, but from your survey, from the FWI 2023, you know, it, it seems like Singaporeans are putting retirement on a back burner, right? Like 68, I remember 68% in 2022 were planning for retirement and then now it's like 60%. So do you have anything to, to say for, for, for this particular group? Definitely, yeah. you know. <laughs> so he got a lot of things to say, he prepared. Uh. Yeah, of <laughs> course. So that's facts of life, right? You know, that uh, the retirement planning actually this year has, uh, I mean, has taken a back seat. And we all know inflation, this is a, Global problem is not just unique to Singapore. And with inflation running high, uh, it's definitely made a lot of things expensive. You know, last time our Takwitao two years, three years ago was so expensive. Now it's like, whoa, you know, the cost has definitely has I know, increased. I know. My my when I do my content in the past, right? But just three years ago, my baseline example was still like $3.50 or $4 a meal, right? Now it's like $5.50, you know, like you add the drink, right? You're at least uh, 7 to 8 bucks. And on the cheapest, you, you want to you wanna kind of go through in a day, right? So it's it's crazy. So yeah. Exactly. So with that inflation coming in, uh, that has definitely put uh, that people are actually saving less. Uh, as a result, many actually are postponing their retirement. Um, and by the same, the good thing at the, on, the, on the horizon is they're still having uh, to maintain the good habits. So what exactly are that? But before we get to good habits, um, uh, just on a general, you know, um, the respondents in the 20s to 42s on an average are actually postponing the retirement planning eight years later compared to what was mentioned uh, in 2022. Yeah. Eight years, don't know, can still call fire, you know? <laughs> a <laughs> bit difficult, lah. Retire early, right? Yeah, retire early. Basis of fire, right? Yeah, yeah the fire not burning already. Yeah, or 
<laughs> ashes. <laughs> oh, ashes oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in this kind of current environment whereby inflation are actually higher than previous uh, years, you know, so that was also contributed as well to concerns on economic growth. Uh, is it certain uh, in this current market environment? So they're kind of a hampered their, their conviction that should I put more allocation uh, into planning for my retirement and investing at this current junction? So that kind of put people in a back burner and said, okay, maybe I hold on for a while, while contribute lesser, uh, impacted by inflation, impacted by uncertainty. So that lifestyle aspiration um, in their retirements haven't really changed. They all have these dreams that, oh, I want to, you know, retire with this kind of great lifestyle. And they realize actually, uh, if I kind of not contribute, that decision to be able to retire at that kind of lifestyles, it becomes more diminished. Uh, so hence, that, that has, uh, unfortunately has, has happened. But the good thing, coming back to the positives now, it is definitely encouraging for the Singaporeans that they have actually managed the unsecured debt as well as the housing loans. I mean, with interest rates running higher, so the first thing that a lot of Singaporeans are now putting forth is they make sure that they are better managed in this aspect. Uh, and that has definitely helped in, the, in their good financial decisions during this period of time. Yeah, and I think I want to add on that, right? Essentially, I think a lot of people need to realize that, you know, if uh, your interest rates keep moving up, your cost of debt is very high, your investments may not be able to outrun that thing, right? So, might as well pay it down, right? And I think when I saw the report, I was like, oh, not bad, huh? Singaporeans are level quite high, right? You understand, pay down your unsecured debt, you know, kind of reduce your leverage and then work from there, right? But, but I would argue that I don't think is that Putting retirement on the back burner does not sound like a logical choice. It's, it sounds more like a bopian. You know, people never sit down and say, okay, I'm going to like put retirement <laughs> as a back burner. I feel like it's just everything caught up and it's just become really hard and mortgages move up. And it's a big part of a lot of people's expenses. I've heard many stories, right? Like both spouses, they try to game the system so you take one mortgage, I take one mortgage, you buy one property, I want property. And then everybody was levered up, right? Because, you know, things were going good, interest rates were low, you know, a few years back when they bought it, it's good, right? And the numbers were moving up. But then now, suddenly, this whole thing come together and a lot of them just cannot keep up, right? And you, and you see people resorting to strategies like uh, stay at parents' place, <laughs> you know? Because now fire sale, very hard, right? And that's the reality, right? So I, I, I don't think it's, it's that much of a logical choice, let's put retirement as a back burner, but a little bit of a firefighting type of situation, you know what I mean? Like Bo Pien, you know, oh yeah, so it's kind of, kind of, that's kind of where, where I think lah. Um, even for myself, uh, what we did was we saw that interest rates was, was rising. So uh, we had a discussion as a couple and then we sort of made certain sacrifices and says, okay, let's put some of our finances to work at the same time, pay down our housing loan debt as well. So, so that is more of like a commitment uh, that we kind of like wanted to do and we just kept to it. I totally agree with you because it kind of adds up that the later we decide to deploy consistent money to put to work for, for retirement, later in the, in the years, actually you need to put on more in order to achieve those goals. Mm. Uh, and that's what actually happened to me. Uh, so now I'm a planner, but I didn't start as a planner. I started as, you know, oh, daydream, everything. Oh, I wanted this. Oh, this looks good. But never really got around to do that. Uh, and then it was only a later years. I said, oh my God, this is real. I, I now need to really deploy. So that's where having that financial discipline uh, uh, comes in as well. Meaning to say that, while well, saying is easy, yeah. that's where we then not start to bring in the other attributes such as, having the financial discipline. Mm. So I, we actually discovered that by tracking, I know this is going to be like so boring, mm. tracking your expenses. Go you, go you. Yeah, <laughs> track, <laughs> no, but it's true. We also talk about it. So yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, yeah. so initially I was like, oh, you know, we just ban it. But sometimes it's painful. When you track your expenses, you realize, wow, actually I want to achieve these goals. But because I'm tracking my expenses, I'm more conscious of my spending. Mm. And then, Every time I now spend, because I'm tracking it, right? I now start to differentiate. Is this a need or is this a one? Mm -hmm. Of course, once in a while, it's like, ah, you know, I just give in. Like, I just want to enjoy a bit of lifestyle as well. But there's a payback time. Sometimes I go for my wants and then next few months, I kind of like, okay, I spend what I want already. That's addition. That's too much in our spending. I overspend my budget. 
and I need to cut back. And then having the excess uh, savings, we will constantly deploy. And that's something interesting as well. Then, uh, I mean, sometimes my, my friends and colleagues as well would then ask, in this kind of market environment, how to constantly invest? High inflation, market yeah. uncertain, yeah. you know, markets today go up, next day come down, yeah. you know, how do you then deal with that? Yeah. So very simple. You know, I say that people with a lot of emotions, uh, they sometimes regret investing. Sometimes what they do is just have to start little. Sometimes they don't feel so much pain by just starting a little. Uh, that's one way of overcoming it. The other thing to overcome it is actually to consistently every month when the income comes in minus expenses, they will contribute a certain portion to investing. And that helps as well. For those who are a little bit more sophisticated, what they can also do is to Which read is us, up like, more. We are quite sophisticated. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep, sort of, sort of. So that's where you find out more about the market environment. Read up, keep yourself informed so that you sort of have a good feel of where the market is going, what sort of instruments are good at this point in time and have a longer term view, keep quality assets, continue to grow the income contribution so that it's a, it's a constant flow of building that cash flow towards the investing uh, for your retirement. Uh, and that kind of really helps and contribute. But for me, what I do is on a monthly basis, I'll just force myself to invest. The question will be what to buy. I think that's common for everybody, right? So for me, I have a rule of thumb. First of all, I would like to be very convinced that these assets are quality and they can have that longevity to go for the longer term perspective. And I also like to look at my own personal investing. And if I suffer losses, it could be mark to market losses. I will actually add up more positions in that. Because it means it's cheaper. Can you expand a little bit? What is mark to market losses? Sure, yeah. sure. So mark to market losses will mean that if I invest this amount today and or in the past, and today because of the market price movements, it has dropped down in price but I haven't sold the asset yet. I haven't sold the investments yet. So hence, this resulted in net losses, but because it's just paper losses. And for me, it's if I'm convinced that the fundamentals hasn't changed, it could be due to temporary forces that has causes these investments to come down in price. I shouldn't regret it. But I can't control the market price movements. So hence, sometimes we just need to put aside those in negative emotions and they're so... Sometimes it's just natural. I feel painful that, oh, I, I'm actually suffering losses here. But think of it long term. Does this asset or investment make sense? And if it does, add on more position into it. Is there a place what you are doing in your investments? Does it make sense to achieve your financial goals? And if it does, add on to it. So that's what I do. So I just add on be it equities or bonds. I'll just choose one. Why? Why do you only choose one? Focus. La. Too many things cannot, cannot diversify. So if I feel that at this moment, on this month, I feel that markets have gone up, equity markets has gone up, I buy bonds. Mm. Then next month, equity price corrected. And because it's corrected, it's cheaper and lower. Yeah, I buy equities. La. Yeah, so I just rotate. Just choose one. So it's either you go for bonds or you go for equities. Okay, okay. How long have you been doing this strategy? Uh, for, for a few years. So how has it performed? Nicely. Okay, okay. Nicely. Yeah, that is good. So you can yeah. beat the market. There are mistakes, but that's where diversification is important. And this comes to the next, next part, right? Like if you bank everything into just a few, two to three different ideas, uh, different products, you will face that pressure. What if I'm wrong? And when you're wrong and you're dealing with money that you're going to retire and, and depend about, or on, right? And if you're wrong you will feel that emotions running, running as well. So yeah. having that diversification on various types, like within the bonds, what are the various ones you can choose? Maybe global, maybe Asia, uh, maybe for equities, different geographic, different sectorial, uh, diversified, you know, maybe fund managers or ETFs, or unit trusts, there's more diversified. And have that different streams of income. Uh, and that really contributes and that helps a lot. Yeah. And there's one very important part that many of us actually kind of forget about that. 
He said, before you start doing investing, before you start planning, I think it's very important to set aside emergency funds. A lot of that has actually felt that that is like a textbook, uh, but actually it's not. I've actually seen real life cases of investors who has not done that because they have failed to, you know, it's like, oh, this is textbook. Oh, why must I put emergency fund? It's, it's sitting there as cash, rotting. I should put it to good use. And what they realize is when they put the money in investing, it swings up and down. The emotions also run up and down. But the problem is when they go into, for example, unforeseen loss of job or certain medicals have hit upon them and they don't have cash for it and they need cash desperately. What if the investments didn't do well at a point in time? They are not able to have that liquid cash to tap on it. And that's where they get really, really sour. Yeah, I, I get it. And as much as it sounds basic, right? I also understand that a lot of people don't do that, right? But there's also a question that I always get, right? And I don't really know how to answer this question is, so I have this emergency fund, okay? I've put out six months, 12 months, 18 months, see how, you know, kiasu I am. I have met people that do three-year emergency fund. Right? Okay, shout out to you, Samuel. Okay, but <laughs> anyway, right? So whatever it is, there are people that already do this and they always ask me this question. It's like, so how should I do this? Should I put it in money markets? Should I do something with it? Should I take on any form of risk with this emergency fund? Or is it supposed to just sit there and, you know, kind of really broad and just kind of be emergency, you know? Do you have any take on that? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I will also still diversify that. Mm. So for myself, what I'll do is I'll just put a certain amount in fixed deposits because that's where I know I can just go out there and just quickly unwind it okay. uh, and get it out. But sometimes I'll also put it in like T-bills. Now, now I think T-bills, uh, treasury government T-bills are pretty attractive. Yeah, yeah. SEO score very high are uh, T-bills. You know, every, every month, keep publishing. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but it may not be as liquid as what you would like it to be. And even unwinding will take some time. Uh, I'll put some in money markets as well. Uh, because I, sometimes I just want to diversify out uh, into, into different sources. Also having that spread out, and of course, some is just sitting in, in cash in, in the current accounts because of emergency, you really need the money and it's already there. You can just straight away on the spot. I don't need to redeem it. I can just activate it straight away. So having that spread of the variations and also even calculating different, everybody is different. I mean to say that I may have more dependency than you. I have my parents, I have my kids and hence my dependency. If something happens and I need to activate that, I'll probably need more emergency fund compared to another. Mm. So again, that variation depends on individuals. Hence, which is why we say, yes, three months is the minimal, but it really depends on the individual's circumstances. Fair, fair, fair. And you, you've heard it, right? Okay, these are the few things that you can play around with. Okay, but I think on the topic of T-bills, right? Essentially, in your report, you also suggest uh, that Singaporeans have been accumulating quite a lot of you know, T-bills, fixed deposits, you know, uh, bonds over the past year, right? It's one of the so-called best performing in, in the report, right? But in this current situation where you hear more and more analysts saying like, oh, interest rates will come down, you know, probability looks like it will turn. Like even recently, the REIT market popped just because the interest rate came out a little bit, you know? So like, what, what is, what, is it still wise at this point in time to explore fixed income instruments, you know, or like bonds or like T-bills or will you change your investment strategy at the at current supposed uh, peak of interest rates? Or that's what everybody seems to be saying. This is exactly the same question that yesterday my colleague was, was approaching me about. And, you know, if, if all of these things, we would like to think that the rates have peaked uh, sometime in a couple of months ago, especially in the US, interest rates uh, are already poising to come down. I would still say that there could be still volatility within the fixed income uh, interest rate environment. But let's think of it of a long, longer term perspective. How often do we get rates to rise up so much, so fast? And usually this can be generally disruptive in an economy because rates have run, risen up too fast. A lot of businesses are finding it hard to adjust and usually that will then lead to a slowdown in economic conditions. So if you were to play it forward and think about this, now yields are high compared to the past, I don't really need to risk going for 
very risky, high yields down the credit quality. Mm, no tech stocks, you know, don't do those things. Is and that what yet, you're I can still be mm. able to, to click on pretty decent yields mm. and build towards my retirement. And that means that, for example, if you would buy a diversified pool of bonds, funds, as an example, uh, you sort of like lock these yields for longer because of the duration. Uh, that means that basically you're still able to get a, a clip of 5 to 6% yields kind of environment. And that's pretty interesting because if you then think about retirement in, in partners come whereby you don't have, uh, you, you need something to, you don't need this income at this point in time. So having to reinvest the dividends until the point where you want to retire, you then change the dividends into a dividend payout. That's your income for retirement. So it does make sense uh, to kind of um, deploy that into fixed income. Now, what about T-bills? I, a lot of investors say, why do I want to take risks when T-bills is risk-free? You know, it's government, it's safe. I get my money. You know, I don't even think so much in terms of bonds too has a price fluctuations. T-bills is pretty much assured. But let's not forget that we are in a high interest rate environment. The question is, will it stay like this forever? What if economic conditions normalize? What if interest rates in the future goes down? You will have a reinvestment risk. And hence, as a result, you put everything of your, of your retirement needs into T-bills. They realize that you face this whereby if in the future, if interest rates is to come down, you realize that you cannot roll over at those yields anymore. At the same time, those bond prices were also gone up by that time. So that reinvestment risk is something that one should grapple with. And hence, there's a need to react now. So how will you react now? I think, I think that's an important thought process because everyone else is saying like, oh, interest rate is more or less here already. It'll, unlikely it will move up, right? So like at this point in time, with the current reality, how would you play it? Yeah. So for myself, I'm desperately trying to save as much as I can at this point in time. And that's, that's what I do with my own, own personal finances as well. Uh, basically, I will actually every month, the moment my paychecks comes in, I minus away how much I estimate I will spend, have a bit of buffer, I will start deploying every month, even for my own self. And I'll keep pushing my wife to do the same as well. Uh, she will do it, la, but you know, after a bit of nudging, then she will, she will do it. La, you know? uh, so I will actually, every month, uh, without fail, I will actually deploy money into fixed income. So you're still doing fixed income? I'm still doing fixed income okay. every so month. So no equities, you're not picking up some of these other things? Not true. Uh, not true. As I earlier mentioned, it's a fixed income world or an equity world uh, on a monthly okay. basis. Okay, okay. So if equities has gone up for the month, then what I'll do is I'll just buy fixed income. If equities has dropped for the month and I suffer losses on my, on my equities, I'll actually go into the equities. But I would say that if I want to have a more consistent, uh, lesser worry, actually my deployment, I'm more skewed towards the fixed income. If I have the money to buy bonds direct, uh, or if not, then I'll just buy the bond funds. Uh, and that's where I will just constantly, every month, I'll actually deploy more into fixed income. Even though the prices in the last couple of weeks has gone up, uh, because you know yields are starting to come down, I will still go for it because the price, the yields are still pretty attractive even to now. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Okay, that's cool. Hey Coconuts, the OCBC Financial Wellness Index is Singapore's first comprehensive study of the financial health of our fellow Singaporeans. But what is interesting this year is they've created six different financial personas to help you better understand yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, and all that jazz. As you know by now, I am an enthusiast, right? But what is important is not about you know whether you are this or you're that, and this is better, that is worse. No, but better understanding yourself helps you make more informed decisions and kind of strengthens what you're good at and cover up some of your weaknesses. So with that, I'm sure you want to know about your financial persona. So very simple, head into the link below to do the quiz to get your financial persona. If you want to have some fun, tag us on our socials, you know, let us know who you are, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, let's continue the show. Yeah. 
So, so that is the opportunity side of things, right? Essentially, if uh, financially you're sound, you still have that space to play around with, you know, continue to accumulate and all that jazz, right? So, so that is quite standard, lah, right? But, but thanks for sharing uh, the strategy that you do on your own. So that is good. But I want to double down a little bit on the whole like mortgage side of thing, the whole property thing, you know, which feels a little bit like a hot potato at this point in time on a lot of people's hands, right? Maybe they have a few property, they are levered up, you know, what would you recommend them to to do at this point in time? With with the with the idea that some of them are actually banging on that strategy to retire on. Right. So so what what is the situation now if I got two or three property on my hand and then I'm not I'm not missing payments. Okay. I'm not missing payments, but I am struggling to keep up with this thing. It's a bit hey chuan, you know. So <laughs> what will you tell them to do? Yeah, I think it's really looking in terms of personal finances, in terms of how you manage it, uh, in terms of really a bit of a forecast. And that I think where a lot of people really not forget about is contingency. What if they need to price in their what if one of us loses that job? Is this comfortable? Do I have sufficient spare resources to be able to meet with my, my mortgages? What if rates go up a bit more? We are not the peak yet. But if those situations, I think they really need to kind of work it down in a worksheet uh, to do the balance sheet and the payments so that they really are more confident they can sleep at night uh, to be able to deal with it. Now, property prices, Asians like to buy properties. Really, this is in our blood. I know, yeah. I know. Based on the data on my back end, I know what people are interested in. Yes, yes, yes. This is, yeah. Yeah. So, but at the same time, I would say that yes, hard assets are generally, they, they do appreciate over a longer period of time. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are also periods of time where it may be just plateau or even uh, drop in price. They must be able to stomach these kind of what if situations. And again, after running through all these things, if they are still able to manage it, they, all this still comes to pass and it's okay, I'm fine. I can still manage that what if environment. Then I think it's fine. And if they are not prepared, if their what if statements, if property prices, let's hypothetically say, drop by 20%, let's say, and if they can't find rental and they realize that they're not able to really meet these finances, then it's a hard question is, are you having too much exposure? Is this risk of having these borrowings too much for you to handle? And as a result, they need to find the right truth in terms of how do you then manage that? So what is the right truth? You know, because whatever you said was like pre-problem, right? Like yes. when, when the, you know, when the sun is up, fix your roof, right? So, so, so those are wisdom, you know, that will last a long time. But at this point in time, you know, I think as, as with the OCBC FWI has shown, people are, you know, reprioritizing some of these things, making some changes. That means the fire is burning already, right? Like it's already in front of me. I have to make some decisions. So what would you take on this? I would think that they need to find that level of comfort, meaning to say that property prices are still pretty healthy today, uh, despite of the economic conditions slowing down. They're still in pretty much demand. It's still very... Singapore face... We have a very healthy loan ratio. Uh, we, we are not over geared compared to historical times. And hence, there's a bit of step, there's decent stability in the property market environment. Um, but again, if they feel that this is too much fun to handle and a what if, they may be able to consider what if they reduce exposure by selling one of them. Yeah, yeah. But it depends. It really depends, right? Can they still hold out? If they can hold out, I think that's fine. Um, if they can hold it out, they can still say, oh, what can I do more in my finances to help out? Say, for example, maybe take on another job or, you know, do something to earn the additional income. Cheap back with your parents. <laughs> so Cheap back with your in-laws. Hello, tolong, tolong. <laughs> Rental is still pretty strong, you know. How they, can they cut down your expenses to meet and build that buffer? So there are no financial strategies to play around with once it's like that. In, in your professional view, that means like I'm stuck with two properties, that's it, right? And then you do all these other side things to kind of manage it. Yeah, yeah. I cannot come to the banker and say like, is there something that I can do with this? You know, like 
you will tell me to, oh, you just either sell one thing or you do something else about it. The yeah, kinda... property market is still pretty healthy. I mm. think we are not in the desired state, right? At the conditions right now whereby we are not in a crisis. Um, I wouldn't say that property prices are plunging uh, like compared to China environment. It's still in a very healthy environment. You still can get pretty decent rental. Mm. But if you're really not comfortable with exposure, if you're really very stressed about it, you cannot sleep. And that's where one may then face a hard truth. You can still exit at this current moment, whether of is that the decision that you are willing to take. I wouldn't call it a fire sale. I don't think we are in that kind We're of environment. We're not in that space yet. Okay. We are not in that space compared to China environment. That was, China environment is really the hardcore truth. Um, but of course, even in China, property environments are slowly turning around. Uh, government is definitely putting more measures there. That's a different discussion. But that's yeah. a different discussion. Yeah. But over here, I think in Singapore properties, I think we have very strong fundamentals. Our township are uh, really built on very solid uh, our ecosystem. We are not very highly levered. People are really taking care of their financial payments, the loans, managing it well. Mm. So it's really more about, can you cut down your expenses? I mean, if you want to do all your travel and yet find it hard to meet your mortgage payments, then maybe you... Instead of traveling to Europe, then you do a job haul. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you cut down on some of these no, things. And, and I think it's a little bit of a identity element to it also. Yeah, because you see yeah. all your friends travel far, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm not like that, la, right? So I think you're okay one. La. Just, yeah. you know, tarik a bit. Times will get better. Times will get better, know? yeah. That's kind, of, that's kind of the situation. As much as, you know, uh, Singaporeans are deprioritizing retirement but yep. it is what it is right? it is what it is okay. thanks, thanks for going through that I love that um, and one thing I, I would like to ask and I I saw when I saw it in the OCBC FWI report right, I was like yeah I get it you know uh, 28% of Singaporeans have indicated that they would like to explore retiring in a quote unquote cheaper place Right, right. So that is uh, one of the retirement strategies, supposedly, right, that, that you guys have discovered uh, amongst the Singaporean crowd. Shout, shout out to you guys. Huh? Because as, honestly, as I talk to a lot of finance guys, right, I realize a lot of them all got JB property. Uh, right. So that's a different discussion. Okay. You know, okay. but, but if let's say, you know, our listeners, they are entertaining this idea. Okay, how about we retire elsewhere? Singapore is a great place for us to accumulate, for us to educate our kids. All that jazz, we're, we're good. But we are kind of in this situation where, okay, maybe we plan for retirement elsewhere or in a cheaper area. Like, what do you have to share with them? So, one would then need to then find out about the visas. You know, uh, how, how do you go about applying it? What are the different visa options? How long can you stay there? A combination is actually very important. Uh, how do you then go about, are you going to buy a property there? It will come properly, can you buy? What, what are you eligible for? Or uh, if not, rent. And if you rent, which area? Are you comfortable with the area? What about security of the area that you're going to live in? All of that, you initially also in one need to find out. And in fact, you need to build that buffers as well. Very similar to earlier conversation. A good example I'm saying is Bali. During the COVID period, wow, I tell you, so cheap. The rental is so yes, cheap. Yes, yes, But now you're hearing all the horror stories. The rentals are just escalating very, very fast at a very phenomenal pace. Yeah. And you are just being priced out and you realize that, hey, look, this is not manageable. Um, so a lot of things then come to play about, you know, how do you then move around? Traffic congestions uh, and so on. Uh, what are the best optimal so what about food? Uh, are you comfortable with the food, the lifestyle, the living? What kind of lifestyle do you want to envision living in that place? One thing good is we have a very strong Sing dollars. Yeah, yeah. And as with, you know, you know a good visa and a good Sing, Sing dollar, right? Shout out yeah. to the Singapore government. Exactly. This is good. This is you good. Know, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but all those are simple. People get it, right? There's one question that I really want to ask, which is like this whole insurance thing, right? Because nowadays, a lot of insurance, right? They, they have like, oh, we, we cover global, you know, but, but is it really like that, right? So that means if let's say today, you know, I we accumulate our wealth here, right? We grew up here, you know, we work in Singapore, we use our insurance coverage within Singapore. Then we choose to explore, you know, maybe staying in Malaysia or in Thailand, somewhere else, do we need to explore getting a local coverage? Yeah. You know, is, is, that, is that what you would recommend us yeah. to do? So yes. that means don't, don't, don't try to expect global coverage to cover your needs over there. Especially healthcare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Especially, think that's yeah. probably even more important yes. than healthcare. It is very complicated because different countries will have a different infrastructure, right? Correct. So, so how, how should we think about that part? Yeah, so I guess the best is always to check with the financial institution in terms of the coverage, mm. uh, whether the healthcare coverage that one has bought uh, is 
able to be covered on a global basis. Some can't, some are not. If the decision is really to you know, uh, live abroad for, for that period of time, one will have to consider this added additional cost of having these insurance covered as well, especially addressing the healthcare needs. Uh, that's something that unfortunately it's is unavoidable because the risk is just too big if one has one does not have those kind of coverage. Yeah, so I think a lot of these things will all adds up. Uh, so it's not as simple as wow, you know, I I think that place is cheaper, but once you get there, it's like, oh, I need to think of all these things like lodging, healthcare, yeah. insurance, transport, yeah. safety. Yeah, it all adds up. But we vote from anywhere. You can test it out, lah. Right? I think I think that's kind of a, a situation where I think more people can kind of test out, oh, kind of stay around, see if if these places vibe with you, and then you can kind of take it from there. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, you find the way of life that you want. Yeah. Right. And I think that's a big part of what the report is also talking about, which personality, working with who you are as a person. Right. Don't don't just you know people tell you what you do what right. Like you kind of have to work with your inner ideas and your underlying personas. You know. I think I think that's very important. Uh. Okay. So I think in closing, right, you've, you've shared a lot of good stuff. We have been we've gone into very specifics, which I enjoy, because a lot of bankers always tell me all the big big ideas, uh, but no specifics. So I like the specifics. Uh, in closing, do you have any other things you want to share? You know, to help our audience achieve their retirement or fire or whatever retirement that they want to achieve. I would think so. Um, you know, we all believe that our trades actually do contribute in able to solidify and work towards our financial wellness, you know. Uh, so having understanding your personal traits can actually help you. But often the question would be if, what if you have, you know, some less positive traits? Uh, does that mean that you do, you're not able to achieve those things? Actually, on the contrary, not true. Because in every personality, there are still good points there. And the less positive points uh, are less positive uh, a detraction uh, will be where one can still overcome it. Like for example, I myself, uh, I tend to have all these big ideas. I like to plan, but I never get to go around getting it, getting, get, get to know it. But having to understand that these are my flaws, I don't now work around a system to how to buy, go about achieving these things. Yeah, essentially telling Rakesh, right, don't howl it. Nah. There's a thing, you planner, that means you pout it, right? Like, <laughs> that's that's yeah, yeah, exactly yeah. true right? too. You planner, yeah, you're very specific. Even in the index, right, you perform better, right? Supposedly, yeah. planners perform better in the OCBC FWI index. Okay, so what, right? Yeah, you plan, you must still execute, you must still do it, right? So every trait has its own positive and its own weaknesses, right? Yeah, so don't judge the enthusiast, huh? because, because I, I'm the enthusiast. <laughs> Yep, so having to understand your personality traits is important, but know where are your strengths, your weaknesses, and where are the steps to then overcome that. For example, if one is very emotional, regrets your investment decisions, uh, then one can then start small, have a consistent every monthly to contribute towards it, to work towards that. And having that system to be able to then track your expenses well, then give you a better assurance that, oh, you know, I have sufficient to be able to deploy, uh, to be able to contribute to achieve my goals. Uh, so that's even very important as well to overcome that and also to deploy with digital tools. I think a lot of today, a lot of methods uh, um, using, you can, you can track using digital tools. Or you can even automate, seek professional, yeah, seek professional advice, I automate that. And even consistent, put in the reminder to, to review and, uh, and to really look into, in terms of your investment outlook. Um, and that really helps a lot as well. Uh, then that comes to the second point. Um, I think it's very important to have good financial disciplines as well as virtues. So say, for example, it may sound very sim simple, um, safe regularly. I it's love easy how you start with, it may sound simple because it sounds simple. It sounds simple. <laughs> like, right? So when you prequel that, right, then you know it's simple. Yeah. But simple does not mean it's not relevant. Simple does not mean it's not like, you know, some of these wisdom, they sound very simple, but you know, they, they, they call for it, right? There, there's value in them. And it's very effective because when you then, you know, have that mindset that you want to save regularly, but what do you then do with that savings? Are you doing deploy it uh, to make it grow to have a better return, to work towards your goals. And you realize that you probably need lesser uh, compared to just saving it under the pillow. 
No, no, no. I, I don't think people do that anymore. But I have seen the tingkat before. Yes, tingkat, yes, the, my great grandmother. Yeah, yeah. That time the tingkat come down, then inside got the fifty dollar come out like that, right? I, I've seen that. Yeah, and the fifty dollar is the boat one. Long ago, you know the currency, right? <laughs> But yeah, that's a different discussion. Yeah. And in fact, it's, while it's harder to stick with the financial virtues and habits, right? But having to cut down on undesirable habits, it works as well. Uh, for example, excessive uh, leverage, you know, or even gambling. Uh, they realize that there are a lot of things, it becomes uncontrollable uh, and more unpredictable. And so, so that kind of uh, really is important as well. And in fact, recently, MS has also released basic financial planning guide. Uh, and that really helps the Singaporeans to really plan better as well. With that guide, it really instill more disciplined approach uh, to be able to help to contribute that as, as well. Uh, and I'm going to enter the last point, which I think is also equally important. Having to done the first two steps, uh, the third one will be more of take a disciplined approach uh, towards achieving your goals. For example, earlier we did discuss about uh, having to diversify. So that releases the stress that, oh, did I invest correctly? Because now I have more multiple streams of assets and investments, different streams of income. I'm less concerned about a particular investment that didn't make it through. Uh, that diversification really released that kind of stress. And the other approach is one common mistake that I've already done enough. I've invested one lump sum for my retirement and that's it. I'm not going to do any more. And that's a common mistake as well. Uh, whereby we realize that as you earn, as you continue to, to grow, having the regular monthly investments or regular investments to constantly deploy the resources uh, and to be able to make it work towards those goals, you realize that you're able to achieve these goals after a few years. It's like, wow, actually my investments grew. Uh, because of these regular contributions. Yeah. And the last one will be set automated reminders. Very often, we, we always think of invest, 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 and you don't review. Are we still on the right track? Has any of the if things that we have invested, have they detracted away? Have our financial conditions and situations changed? Maybe having a new kid or a different stage of life whereby the priorities are changing. And hence, even the mode of investments are you taking as too much excessive risk and as a get closer towards your retirement age? Maybe you, just, you don't want to take as much risk as compared to the younger days. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of adjustments are, are important as well. When you add all of these, you actually uh, solidify your position to be able to achieve those goals. Nice, nice. And, and I think one thing in the report that really caught my eyes was the people that are clear about the number that they need. I think that is very, very important because I've talked to many people and I feel like a lot of their fear is unfounded. It, not in the sense that the fear is not right. It's just that because they have no basis of clarity from, from the way of life that they want. So it, everything is buffered up one. You know, so it's like because you're not sure, you're not sure the exact number, so everything just gets buffered up. And then it becomes this like crazy big number that you need for retirement. And then it scares you. And then the cycle makes it horrible. And then you stave off away from it. Right. So I think for a lot of you listening in, you know, uh, whether you're regular or not, doesn't matter. But I think what is important is to realize that a big part of success in retirement and getting towards that is actually knowing what's the number that you need. Right, and working through the line by line item sounds very lame, la, but it's important, right? And I think in the report it does reflect that if you do that, your your chances of retiring early and retiring well, you know, increases. I have a word for that. Is to put a purpose and meaning to why you invest. And once you have the purpose and meaning, you now understand what you need to do in terms of the risk, in terms of the steps, whether is there a need to diversify into which area and to feed that into your own personality. So I think that's important. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Right. And uh, do the persona, financial persona, OCBC, FWI, financial persona. Link is in the description below. Yeah. We'll see all of you next week. Bye. Bye.